The bimolecular elimination mechanism, or E2, involves concerted deprotonation and loss of the leaving group. And so, analogously to SN2, this reaction proceeds through a single elementary step. The base deprotonates a hydrogen at the beta position with respect to the leaving group, a new pi bond is formed, and the leaving group departs. The fact that these two stages occur simultaneously has some interesting consequences. This elementary step involves two orbital interactions, one of which enforces a very specific orientation between the bond between the beta hydrogen and carbon and the bond between the adjacent carbon and the leaving group. This orientation has stereochemical consequences for the alkene product. Let's briefly review the bimolecular elimination elementary step. In this step, two key orbital interactions are involved, but the one that's most important is between a sigma orbital and a sigma star antibonding orbital. The sigma orbital involved is the carbon-hydrogen sigma bonding orbital corresponding to the hydrogen that gets deprotonated, and the sigma star antibonding orbital that's involved is the antibonding orbital for the carbon leaving group bond. Here the leaving group is chlorine, and this orbital is relatively low in energy, that is relatively reactive, due to the electronegativity of the chlorine here. This image shows the carbon-hydrogen sigma bonding orbital drawn in red and blue to signify that it's filled, overlapping with the carbon-chlorine sigma star antibonding orbital, which is drawn in yellow and green to signify that it's empty. The key orbital overlap occurs between the largest lobe of the carbon-hydrogen bonding orbital and the backside lobe on carbon of the carbon-chlorine sigma star antibonding orbital. This overlap is what ultimately gives rise to the pi bond in the product. And this type of orbital overlap is exactly what's implied by these curved arrows, with an arrow starting at the CH sigma bond and pointing toward the carbon-chlorine bond, which breaks toward chlorine. Notice that the orbitals here overlap in a side-by-side -side fashion, much as they would in, for example, considering resonance structures. This is what we refer to as pi-type or side-on overlap. An important thing to note is that the CH bonding electrons aren't reactive enough on their own to kick off chloride. If they were, the molecule would just fall apart spontaneously, and it doesn't. Instead, the CH bonding electrons receive a push via donation of electron pair from a base such as methoxide. This N to sigma star interaction gives the sigma bonding electrons the energy they need to kick off chloride. One final point, the implications of which we'll explore in detail on the next slide, is that because of this orbital overlap, the carbon-hydrogen bond and the carbon-leaving group bond must be aligned in an anti-orientation. Notice that the implied dihedral angle here is 180 degrees. In case it's easier to see here, I'll highlight the same bonds on the starting material structure there. This requirement that the bonds to the hydrogen and the leaving group be aligned anti has two important implications. The first is that substrates containing stereocenters will yield a particular stereoisomer, either E or Z, depending on the stereochemistry of the starting material. Take this example, in which the two carbons involved in the elimination are both stereocenters. The implied hydrogen on this carbon is the hydrogen that will be deprotonated in this process. In fact, it's the only beta hydrogen. The phenyl ring has no beta hydrogens. We can draw a Newman projection looking down the bond connecting these two carbons, the bond that ultimately becomes the double bond, to get a sense of how this anti-requirement dictates the outcome of the reaction. I'm going to go ahead and draw in the other implied hydrogen at the carbon linked to the leaving group, meaning that what we would see on the front carbon would be something like this, an inverted Y shape with the phenyl group on top, the bromine pointing down to the right, and the hydrogen pointing down to the left. On the back carbon, conveniently the hydrogen is already anti to the bromine. Since I drew it in blue above, I'll draw it in blue here. And the other two groups, the deuterium and the CH3, are located here. The deuterium is pointing up and to the right, and the CH3 is pointing down, like so, anti to the phenyl ring. What happens as this elimination takes place? Well, the bromide departs with the pair of electrons and moves off this way. The hydrogen departs as a proton with the base and moves off in this direction. And the phenyl ring and H kind of fold downward like this, and the CH3 and deuterium sort of fold up like this. What this means is that the phenyl ring and deuterium will end up cis in the product. Notice how they're moving towards each other. This naturally implies that the CH3 and hydrogen will also end up cis, or on the same side of the new alkene in the product. So the final alkene will have the following structure. Deuterium, 
and the fennel ring on one side of the double bond, and it doesn't really matter which side of the double bond we draw those groups on, and hydrogen and the methyl group on the other side of the double bond. What if we think about a similar E2 elimination, leaving the stereocenter bearing the leaving group the same, but we change the configuration of the carbon bearing the acidic hydrogen. Now the acidic hydrogen is pointed out towards us and the deuterium back away from us. We've switched the positions of those two groups, leading to a diastereomer of the starting material that we looked at before. Let's again draw a Newman projection of the situation looking down the carbon-carbon bond from this direction. Nothing's happened at the front carbon, so the phenyl ring is still pointed up, the bromine still down and to the right, and the hydrogen still down and to the left. The CH3 group is still anti to the phenyl ring, but now the deuterium and the hydrogen have switched places. Hydrogen is here, and deuterium is here. Notice that in this conformation that we've drawn, the acidic beta hydrogen and the leaving group are no longer anti. They're in a gauche orientation in this conformation. In order to get them anti, we need to rotate that back carbon around 120 degrees to position the hydrogen where the deuterium is now. But notice what this has done. The phenyl ring and deuterium are now on opposite sides of the plane formed by hydrogen, the two carbons that will become the alkene carbons, and the leaving group. The CH3 and hydrogen are also on opposite sides of this plane. In the products of this reaction, now the hydrogen and deuterium will be cis to each other, while the phenyl ring and the methyl group will be cis to each other. The configuration of the double bond has switched from what we would call E in the product on the left to Z in the product on the right. Notice here that diastereomeric starting materials, these two alkyl halide starting materials, are giving rise to diastereomeric products. And a simple change in configuration switches the configuration of the product 100%. This is an example of a situation in which the reaction is stereo-specific. This term refers to a situation in which changing the configuration of the starting material leads to a change in the configuration of the product with 100% fidelity. In fact, the SN2 reaction works the same way, though we didn't identify it then. If we change the configuration of the electrophilic carbon, for example, in a case when it's a stereocenter, that leads to a change in configuration of the product. Because the reaction is stereospecific, it occurs via 100% inversion of configuration in that case. In this case, the origin of the stereospecificity is this anti-orientation of the hydrogen and leaving group, required for good orbital overlap. The second important implication of this stereoelectronic requirement, this requirement that the bonds to hydrogen and the leaving group be aligned to anti, is that for some substrates, E2 elimination cannot occur or occurs extremely slowly. And these are starting materials in which the hydrogen and leaving group cannot achieve this anti-orientation. This occurs most commonly in certain types of cyclic substrates. Let's look at a couple of examples. In this first substrate, E2 elimination occurs without issue. Notice that we have all of the ingredients necessary for a good E2 elimination. Strong base in this tert butoxide, a carbon bearing a good leaving group, and beta hydrogens on the carbons adjacent to the one bearing the leaving group. And so, in this particular case, E2 elimination goes off without a hitch, and the resulting product looks like this. Here's a related reaction in which all we did was change the configuration of this carbon bearing the leaving group. The configuration of the carbon bearing the tert butyl group is still the same, and so these two molecules are diastereomers. In this case, no reaction occurs. In fact, substitution in this case becomes more rapid than elimination. There's no E2 that we observe in this case. What's going on here? Well, notice that these two substrates are cyclohexanes, and it helps here to consider the dominant chair forms in each case. Because the tert butyl group is so large, the dominant chair form by far, orders of magnitude by far, will place the tert butyl group in an equatorial orientation, and in fact that's true of both chair forms. In the case on the right, because the tert butyl group is equatorial, pointed up, and the bromine is cis to the tert butyl group, that bromine must be located in an axial position. But in the diastereomer, of course, the bromine and the hydrogen there have switched places meaning that the bromine here has to be in an equatorial orientation. In the case on the left, the bromine is anti to two hydrogens at the carbon's beta to the leaving group. We could use Newman projections to verify that these two groups are anti, but I'll just use highlighting on the chair forms to show this here. 
In this substrate, an anti-orientation of the carbon-hydrogen and carbon-bromine bonds is possible. What about the other substrate? Well, let's draw out the hydrogens linked to the beta carbons in this other substrate and see what the situation is. What atoms or groups are anti to the carbon-bromine bond? Well, if we look at the group positioned at 180 degrees to the carbon-bromine bond, we find not hydrogens, but carbons. The carbon-bromine bond is anti to a carbon-carbon bond within the ring, not a carbon-hydrogen bond. If we focus on either of the carbon-hydrogen bonds, what we find is that the carbon-bromine bond is gauche to all four of these. And there's no way to orient these hydrogens anti to the bromine without flipping the chair, which is not possible because of the tert-butyl group, which locks the molecule effectively in this conformation. Because the carbon-bromine bond is anti to carbon-carbon bonds, elimination would have to occur through some kind of syn-type mechanism, which involves much poorer orbital overlap between the CH sigma bonding orbital and the carbon-bromine sigma antibonding orbital. One last point about E2 elimination is just that it follows Zaitsev's rule in that the more substituted alkene is favored over the less substituted alkene in substrates that have distinct sets of beta hydrogens. Here we have one such substrate with methyl hydrogens, which I'm highlighting in blue, the reaction coordinate for elimination of which is shown here with a blue dotted line, and methylene hydrogens, which I'm highlighting in red, whose reaction coordinate is shown here in pink. Elimination of one of the two methylene hydrogens leads to a disubstituted double bond, but elimination of one of the methyl hydrogens leads only to a monosubstituted double bond, which is higher in energy, as we see on the right-hand side, on the product side of this diagram. This shift in stability of the products going from a less substituted to a more substituted double bond also has an effect on the transition state energies. The transition state energy is pulled down somewhat as well. This correlation between an energy difference between a pair of products or reactants and an energy difference between transition states is referred to as Hammond's postulate. It's only really a conjecture because, in theory, kinetics and thermodynamics are not theoretically related. But Hammond's postulate notes that in a practical sense, often a change in stability of, for example, a pair of products leads to a change in kinetics that's consistent with that change in stability of the products. In other words, the more stable product is formed more rapidly than the less stable product. And that's what we observe here.